Coming up on this edition of Able Den On Air, we focus on diabetes and caregiving, and we talk to Deborah Arms, a foremost expert in the field of um, being a nurse practitioner and dealing with diabetes. And we also talk about obesity and the problem in this country. All that and much more when Ableton On Air starts right now. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of all people with all abilities despite their disabilities. Um, with me today, we talk to Deborah Arms, a nurse practitioner from, from Ohio that um, we'll talk about caregiving and diabetes and obesity and many other uh, situations uh, situations within obesity. Welcome to Ableton On Air, and thank you for being on the program. Thank you. I'm honored to be here and in this space. Um, just want to tell you my name's pronounced Deidre. Sorry. <laughs> De I apologize. De Deidre Arms. I, I, I I completely apologize. Um, okay, so happens all the time. <laughs> okay, N okay, not a problem. Um, so let so let's begin. Uh, tell me what exactly does a nurse practitioner do, and you know if you want to uh, tell us a little bit about your work in being a nurse practitioner. Let's start. There. Okay, so. A nurse practitioner is a nurse with an advanced degree, either a master's or a doctorate. We're able to prescribe, we're able to diagnose um, like any other provider would be able to. But on my journey being a nurse practitioner, I have focused in the area of functional medicine, which is really getting to the root cause of chronic diseases. So I have extensive training through the Institute of Functional Medicine, A4M, and have done lots of conferences and deep dives into root cause of chronic conditions as well. So most of us have been nurses prior to for many years. Um, I was a nurse almost 10 years before I got my degree as an NP, and I've been an NP um, even longer than that. So. Okay, um, so uh, when we talk about diabetes and caregiving, I'll give you an example. My wife, and um, she's letting me talk about this, uh, my wife recently became an amputee due to gangrene and um, septic shock and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, diabetes can be one of those things that if you don't take care of yourself, and you don't listen to a doctor, it can get kind of um, really bad. So take us through the importance of taking care of yourself with diabetes and go from there. The floor is okay. yours. So when I have a patient, one of the first things that we start to look at that happens well before you become diabetic is that you become insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. And that is where, so in our cells, um, it's like a lock and key we have where it opens up the glucose transport and glucose can enter the cell. So what starts to happen is you get a resistance to that and that's why we get the high levels of glucose circulating in the blood and when we get higher levels of glucose circulating in the blood then we start to to go on that trajectory of diabetes and there's a difference between type 1 and type 2 so type 2 is an autoimmune type that um, is really when the cells of the pancreas um, you start to lose production of insulin and in those but with type 2 diabetes we we've always called this adult onset however we're seeing it in children more and it's more related to um, where you're having insulin resistance in the cells um, and lifestyle factors such as our diet such as exercise such as managing stress I can't say that enough can improve our diabetic numbers and our glucose. Okay, so um, 
you said a whole bunch, you know, you said a mouthful there, diabetic <laughs> numbers, glue clothes. So, uh, example, uh, my wife's numbers were very bad, and other people's numbers might be horrible. Uh, when she was rushed to the hospital, her numbers were, uh, her sugar was 900, and her A1C was 1200. Uh, it was it was upwards in that number. Um, how 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 horrible is horrible, and how can we really um, deal with the numbers to make them not so horrible? If if I'm saying that right. Yeah, and so. I think what you're asking is what's a good number for your blood sugar, mm -hmm. um, which most people that's between 80 and 130. And this is your fasting, right? And fasting means before, about you, eight eat. Hours. before you eat, right? Right. Before you eat at least about eight hours mm -hmm. before that. And when we eat, you know, our blood sugar is going to rise. But any time that you are waking up, with the blood sugar more than 126 fasting mm -hmm. after eight hours of no food intake, calorie intake on two different occasions, that's a diagnosis of diabetes. So it's not a, a high number that puts us in this metabolic um, problem here. And then an A1C of 6.5 or greater is considered diabetes. And so the higher the number, the more issues that we see like on the microvascular and so that's your vessels that's your cardiac that's your kidneys all of that the higher the numbers for the longer point of time and you have to think of that as what what's happening is there's inflammation in the vessel in the body and the more inflamed we are the higher that we're going to have um, chronic conditions okay uh, when you say the more inflamed, what exactly does that mean? So higher levels of glucose in the body causes inflammation. So you just think of it as like your vessels are on fire. Mm -hmm. Your gut is on fire. Your, you know, the heart vessels are on fire inside the vessel wall. It's like irritated and red, kind of like if you were to wreck your bike when you were a kid and you got up and you maybe had stuff all over your shin, it was red and bleeding, that's happening inside the vessel with diabetes. And so we want to do things proactively to decrease inflammation and that flame. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's get, um, <laughs> it sounds funny, uh, taste the rainbow, but um, <laughs> the food intake, n n numbers, are astronomically high according to the CDC and the world you know obesity has been a problem um, sometimes when you live in a in a area where you you it's like a food desert if you understand mm -hmm. what I mean by that where, where you hardly get good nutritious food in a supermarket or or one you know and you have to go all over the place um, and sometimes it, there's something called a medical desert where you can't get good medical care. Um, <laughs> taste the rainbow. What is a good meal and a bad meal when it comes to that? Well, I heard that taste the rainbow in this case is vegetables, which is important in our diet. So go, we're not talking about Skittles. But uh, we're not talking about Skittles, you're right. <laughs> you know, so, not talking about M&Ms, but go ahead. Right. And, and so why we talk about vegetables and fruits and whole foods is really important because when you start to eat vegetables and you eat fruits, right, for your for the sugars that you're getting, you actually are getting fiber that surrounds those fruits and vegetables, and that will slow down a glucose spike with other things that you eat. So we're, you know, we may not be perfect at first. And I think for somebody new to diabetes and somebody who's new to caregiving to diabetes, it's pretty overwhelming how we're supposed to eat. But some simple things that you can do is in your meal, eat your vegetable first, 
followed by a lean, good source of protein, and eat any carbs less. That's the first thing you can start to do. Just change the sequence in what you eat. Making sure that you're getting seven to 10 good colors of vegetables and fruit a day. So that's what we talk about, eating the rainbow. And it doesn't have to be full <laughs> servings, right? You just want a little bit here and there because diversity of those fruits and vegetables is what helps promote uh, decrease in inflammation and provoke, promote longevity and can help us with uh, diabetes and the complications. Is portion control, I know I'm kind of jumping here, but you certain point, is um, portion control important when it comes to, um, di to diabetes as far as uh, um, as far as, uh, you know, you know, um, uh, the plate, you know, like four ounces of this, eight ounces of this, so on. Do we have to have portion control? Because I, I, I understand you can eat as much salad and vegetables as you want, but it's the dressing that has the calories, if I'm not mistaken. But go ahead. What, is there... Is there a such thing as good portion control and bad portion control? So what I would say about portion control is it really has to do with what types of foods you're eating, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're eating highly processed foods, you really have to pay attention to your portion control. And highly processed foods are anything that's not on the perimeter of your store. So if you're walking down the aisle and you pick up something and there's ingredients you can't read, those are highly processed foods. If there's more than four ingredients on a label, it's processed. So if that consists of your diet, you are gonna have to pay attention to portion control and everything. If your diet is more whole foods, like vegetables with minimal added additives you can add spices all you want they're polyphenols they're really good for the body um, you can add cold pressed olive oil things like that but when you start to add like the dressings and things like that we're adding extra carbs like we're so we have to watch those processed things but if you're eating vegetables and your lean meats and fruits um, you don't have to as much pay attention to portion control, with the exception of when you're first diagnosed with diabetes, it actually is better to limit your fruits until you get your numbers under control, and then you can add that back in. Okay, what's the difference between, since you said fruits, and I know I'm ad-libbing here, but <laughs> uh, fruits in terms of sugar, okay? Um, you know, you have, say, Tropicana orange juice, okay? And then an orange. What has more sugar as far as uh, that's concerned? Hands down the juices all day long. I would say if you're newly diabetic and, and a caregiver, you really want to avoid giving people fruit juices. They spike it. Mm. Uh, glucose high. And it's because when you eat something, you actually are absorbing the fibers in it. And the fibers are what slow down any glucose spike. Explain again or explain more if you can. Yeah. And so when we eat a fruit or vegetable in its whole form, right, mm -hmm. we get the fiber. Increase in fiber is what helps, you know, slow down any glucose spike with whatever we eat after that. Oh, so, it, I mean, for example, um, and a lot of people snack. So, I mean, you wouldn't go from, uh, you know, an orange and then a candy bar because then it'll bring up your, it'll spike, it'll spike your numbers, correct? As far as Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, when it comes uh, when it comes to caregiving in terms of diabetes, um, what are some tips that people should um, watch out for? Is there any particular tips that you that you, you can start giving so people can understand this? 
Yeah, so I think, um, you know, don't beat yourself up, first of all, because this is probably new to you as well as the newly diagnosed diabetic. I would start with focusing on how we can make little changes. I use this analogy all the time. Health is like an onion, right? Mm -hmm. We peel off the layers until we get to the best version of ourselves. If we cut you to the middle and we give you 19 things that you're supposed to do, all we're going to do is make you cry, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever you're talking to that person, you're the caregiver and you're like, okay, what can you actually do? this week what can we do 80 percent of the time that you know you're going to be able to do and manage without it overwhelming you because remember stress has an impact on your glucose as well and if you get completely stressed out about this new diet well that's going to raise blood sugars also so start with something simple like the sequence of eating like vegetables then protein followed by any carbs less. I would start there. I would really focus on your protein intake and talk to your provider about that too, making sure you're getting adequate protein. Um, and those are some simple things. And then the Mediterranean diet is the most studied diet out there. So mm -hmm. start to look at that. You know, at first our taste buds might not want all of the things, but if we gradually add things in, it can be manageable. What, why is the Mediterranean diet considered the best diet? Ah, that's always a good question, right? Um, so Mediterranean diet is really focused on your omega-3s. It's focused on whole plants and lean meats as well. But there's also some research that suggests that communication between others, like in the Mediterranean, which is the blue zone where people in the world live the longest to be over 100, there's more 100 year olds than anywhere in the world. Um, it's our connection to each other as well. So we have to start thinking of food as nourishing our body. It has the ability to turn on and turn off disease. Mm -hmm. So think of it as food is medicine. And so we're going to give ourselves what nourishes our body. Okay. So I'm going to bring up some years ago, there was a movie called or a documentary. It's called Supersize Me. Okay. I don't know if you've seen it. Okay. Yes. Where they followed a gentleman uh, that, went to McDonald's, for, I think, for a whole entire year, okay? And he got really, 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 really sick um, to the point where the doctor says, you're going to die if you, if you don't stop eating this stuff. Um, fast food, now I know fast food places such, um, such as McDonald's and others, um, you know, they, they have healthy food options if people have no other place to go to eat. But can you kind of break that down? Um, is fast food bad for you? Is it, can it, I mean, can, can someone have a cheat day? Are they allowed on a diabetic diet um, to do this? Uh, yes, no, uh, if, I'm, if I'm saying that right. Okay. Um. Those are all really great questions. In general, sorry to throw you off. Sorry to throw you off. Okay. In general, fast food is really high in calories, so that's part of it. Um, the fast food that maybe your grandparents ate actually is much different in the processing than what we have available now. So, a French fry back in the '50s from McDonald's had only a few ingredients and now the french fry i think they have 16 ingredients that are all chemicals so that's that's part of it there's unhealthy fats there's added sugars and this can all lead to issues with blood sugar control and so when you think about that show super size me right it showed that taking that intake of high fat fast food increased our insulin resistance type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease, right? Um, so eating it occasionally can be okay, right? Mm -hmm. Anything we do occasionally can be okay. Um, but making healthier choices like the salads, like the grilled proteins. Um, I'll give my grandmother for an, 
instance um if she eats at mcdonald's she never gets the bun she only eats the grilled meat and she never gets the fries and she gets her iced tea without sweetener so th that's her she's almost 90 years old she's doing something right <laughs> so um the, but so just, is yeah go ahead looking at making the healthy choices if you do decide to have a cheat day and and, and that's the whole thing. We have to live. We have to sometimes not think about food that way. And if it's a once in a while thing, that can be okay. It's one meal. If you end up at a fast food restaurant, just remember, don't beat yourself up and think, oh, I've derailed everything. It is one meal and we can get back on track the next. So speaking about fast food, is there a... Is there a, a myth when it comes to trans fat or, uh, you know, like you said, the French fries, they, you know, have 16 ingredients, but, you know, the oil is cooked in might be good or um, if there's any truth to that, you want to say anything in, in reference to any, uh, you know, dispelling any of the myths about fast food in terms of that? So it, typically in these fast food restaurants, um, most everything is cooked with canola oil. Canola oil is one of the hardest oils for us to break down and the body can cause a lot of issues there. So really, if you're looking at the most optimal type of oil would be staying away from the seed oils and looking at an olive oil or um, that's probably the best. A coconut oil um, can be easy to use as well. We did a whole episode on this um, with the way to my heart on the different fats and everything and what are the better ones. Sometimes it's hard to know what you're actually getting when you're in a restaurant. We can only be the most control when we eat at home. So one of the tips I tell people is limit how many times you're eating out in a week. So if you're eating out two times or less, you have more control over the oils and things. So your trans fat oils like canola oil are, are worse for you than something like a cold pressed olive oil. Mm -hmm. Now, um, obesity in this country uh, you know, the numbers are horrible, um, you know, and then diabetes gets worse. Does diabetes get worse when someone is overweight or because um, I know that you have the BMI numbers uh, from what I've studied. Uh, what is a good number to be, um, you know, if you're a man? And if you're a woman, what is a good number to be, you know, as far as uh, the goal weight here when it comes to um, diabetes, if okay. I'm saying that right? Yes. Yeah, so some of the new evidence is saying that BMI is not the most optimal, optimal way mm -hmm. um, to assess waist circumference is now starting to be more of a way. But when we look at BMI, what we know about it right now and what we've been saying is um, anything under 30 is better for your heart. Any BMI 26 and under um, is the most optimal for um, any adult. But when we look at waist circumference, we're looking at like under 30 inches in a female and 35 in a male. So we're really wanting um, to look at waist circumference because it matters where we store our fat too. So this, it, you know, having adipose tissue, um, you know, we store it in different ways, but the, the worst part of where fat is stored is if it's stored around the organs. And so abdominal circumference can tell us a little bit more about if it's stored. So we always talk about the apple and the pear shaped, right? So if you're storing more of your fat and your central, it's probably more around the liver, um, heart, everything. And if you're storing it, if you have the pear shape and it's more in the hips and thighs, it's less fat around the organs. Okay. Um, now, is, is, is there a more of a problem with diabetes in children than adults? Because I've um, 
for example, they have that TV show, I don't know if it's still on, My 600-Pound Life. Uh, you see young adults, you see adults. I mean, they're six, 700 pounds. Is there, and then they go through surgery. Is there, uh, is there more of a problem with kids than adults that, that you've seen or if you want to talk about so that? So we have a rise in children with diabetes for sure. Um, a 30% increase the last time I looked up some stuff. And so when a child is faced with this dysregulation and blood sugar and everything, those chronic conditions come much earlier and it shortens lifespan for them. Um, so we've always said type two diabetes is adult onset, but we're seeing it in vast numbers be um, in juveniles as well. And in the- um, at you know, what I apologize. At what age are you seeing it? Is there a particular age? The teenagers, um, there's a higher number of teenagers, but even as low as six years old, I think we're seeing more wow. obesity. Yeah. Um, and it, if we really think about it, 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 it's a lot of how we're fed, these ultra processed foods, right? Those were not a thing before the 70s. Actually, before the 50s, there there wasn't treatment for chronic diseases. There wasn't medications that we stayed on the rest of our life. And now we have children taking medication for diabetes that will they'll have to take lifelong if they do do. So there wasn't there wasn't there weren't uh, medications like metformin or there wasn't anything like that back in the 50s then. Yeah, Correct. so it, like this treatment for chronic disease really started since the 50s. So we had treatment for like your antibiotics, anything that would be short lived. But then um, when you look back historically, we weren't treating um, blood sugars and um, hypertension and things like that, that come later. And now, I mean, you are hard pressed to find an adult that's not on a medication, right? Mm. Um, let's go into, um, cause I asked you this question off camera once the, those devices such as the Libre and other devices like that. Um, let's go into that. Um, are numbers really accurate when it comes to those, those devices? Yes or no? Um, they actually are, but there's a little bit of a difference. So um, one good thing we learned a whole lot about these devices is when COVID happened and we couldn't have nurses going into the room and checking blood sugars, Libre, they donated devices to hospitals so we could manage blood sugars without being in the room. And we found how accurate they really were in this, in what we were doing. Um, so there is when you wear this device so it is in the interstitial space so it's the space just under the skin um, and, and it's very different than when you do a finger prick and you check your blood sugar it takes about 10 minutes to 15 minutes from the time you get a reading on the continuous monitor for a finger prick to catch up to that mm -hmm. so it will be off some by about 15 minutes, but that's just in the way that it delivers. Um, I'm a huge advocate for continuous glucose monitors. There's actually um, now some out that you don't even have to have a prescription. Uh, Stello is the first one out. That's Dexcom. So if you're having trouble getting a continuous glucose monitor, like through your insurance, you can now buy it without it. Um, a prescription and so that's great because that opens up a door for us to manage diabetes better because even if you put one of those on like the studies show just wearing one and understanding what's causing the issues with your glucose will help lower your glucose because for instance you know i may be hugely affected by eating popcorn and you may not be right but well, we just soon right it's a simple carb uh we all are going to have the same response but we don't well popcorn since you since you said that okay plain popcorn with 
nothing on it. That has what? Less than 25 calories, if I'm not mistaken. But it's what you put on it. The butter and caramel. And they have something called fiddle faddle, you know, which is like the caramel popcorn and the Cracker Jacks. So when you start adding it, so food, like vegetables, you can eat as much as you want. But it's the... It, it's the dressings and everything else that makes it more, calo uh, you know, caloric intake, correct? Uh, if I'm not mistaken. Right. I mean, so, yeah, go ahead. When you dress it up with your cheeses and your ranch dressings and everything, you're losing a little bit of the goodness out of it, right? That's when we have to think about um, counting our calories and looking at portion sizes. If you decide to dress up your vegetables instead of using those things and doing it with spices, it's going to be a lot better for you because any spice that has a flavor has polyphenols in it. And that helps promote your immune system. And for um, example, like pep pepper, what, what, what has pepper, pe rosemary, thyme, uh, cayenne, like anything that you can pull out that's a spice that has a flavor and is good has polyphenol. Mm -hmm. um, but but then we start getting into the problem of uh, oh, I was always taught in, in culinary don't overdress a salad because you know people don't like all that dressing but then you know all those calories you know then you add the then you add the croutons and other stuff right so mm -hmm. um, but all right, so let's get into um, something that's, uh, you know, because I basically saved my, uh, I saved my wife's life last year, gangrene, septic shock, and all of that. You know, that's when her diabetes got really bad. So in terms of caregiving, when is there, and again, I know you're not a doctor, but, um, and it's up to people to say, hey, there's some red flags. What are some red flags that people should look out for when they're dealing with diabetes? And when should you see a doctor? I mean, I know there's a lot of people out there that might be stubborn and not want to see a doctor. Go ahead. So if you have diabetes, you need to be seeing your doctor at least minimal every three months, right? Mm -hmm. If you have increasing blood sugars that might be sooner than that especially um, we typically see our patients with diabetes at least every three months to get some labs because we want to look at kidney and liver function right um, see what the cardiovascular system is doing um, and make any tweaks as we need to plus it gives us time to explore what what's going on stressors in life the diet things like that. So when you're a caregiver, some of the things that you can be looking at would be how are the blood sugars, whether you're doing a finger prick and the best time to do it actually is two hours after a meal. That's when you wanna know what's happening, right? Mm -hmm. Your fasting is gonna be probably pretty consistent. So if you really wanna know and you can only do a finger prick, do it two hours after they've eaten. Um, and then you're gonna kind of know what that meal did to them, right? Um, I would say if the blood pressure is rising, that's another reason to get into the doctor sooner. If they're having trouble with their urine, the urine is darker, um, you definitely want them to be seen sooner. Um, any um, swelling so, yeah. Go ahead. in the peripheries, you know, the legs and stuff, um, pitting edema is where like you press in on the leg and it doesn't just pop back out. It stays like pitting. You can see where you pressed in or their socks are making a ring. Those are things to really uh, talk to the doctor about. Mm -hmm. When you say discoloration in urine, um, is how bad is that of a sign of being diabetic? So the discoloration in urine is you want to pay attention to if it's affecting the kidneys, right? Because um, 
we excrete glucose in the urine as well. So if it starts to get a darker amber color, um, yes, it could be dehydration. And especially if you're dealing with an elderly person in your family that you're giving care to, but it also can be, um, you know, affecting the kidneys. Um, okay. So uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, well, we have about about 15 minutes left or so. Um, going back to um, something I spoke to spoke to you yesterday about hospitals, nursing homes, rehab facilities. Um, they put out a menu, okay. <laughs> You know, a person can choose what they want and, and how they want it. Um, but a rehab is, is not like a hospital. You know, it's, it's like somebody's home. Um, what is, I mean, there, there's some of these places are sending out bad messages when it comes to, it's like schools also. Schools have bad menus that they're giving kids. Is there any way that America can change that? Do you, uh, any advice uh, or have you seen um, good menus, bad menus? What's the difference between a good menu and a bad menu when you're helping a resident or a patient in a hospital? Right, so what you're looking at, and I will say some of the hospitals are really jumping on board with this, but it, it really when someone goes out into long-term care facilities, um, you know, we have very little control over the diet and it's the processed foods, even with our kids at school, like those meals are highly processed. So look at if they have a variety of vegetables that are not, um, you know, a bunch of cheese on them and things like that. Most hospitals will have a diabetic diet that's there and give you choices, um, help you to understand how to count a carb and um and give you some flexibility on what you eat and i think if you have the opportunity and we say this all the time um with what, the weight of my heart is everybody should see a dietitian right mm -hmm. Every, everybody with a chronic condition should cash in on that with your insurance and actually talk to someone and they have them in many of the facilities as well but if you feel that like you have somebody who's recovering in a rehab and they're not getting the adequate, I would definitely talk to the dietitians and to um, the cafeteria staff and everything and help to advocate for that person, okay. you know. So uh, since we have a couple of minutes left, why don't you talk about what you do for, uh, for the weight of my heart and how you educate people in that way? Okay. so. Every Wednesday, we do a YouTube channel and it's there. So you like and subscribe to that if you are interested. But we talk about questions that patients have about certain things. So last week, we talked about longevity. Uh, tomorrow, we're talking about intermittent fasting. So it's really uh, patient led. Uh, these are patients who have peripheral arterial disease or diabetes or some sort of cardiovascular disease and um, really just helping to navigate like like you said about the oils like what are the myths and things like that it can be really overwhelming and confusing so this gives an opportunity for us to get like the studied research stuff out there and the newest things out there to help with health okay um so Really quick, uh, intermittent fasting, certain holidays, like certain religious holidays, you, you know, you, you fast for a religious reason. But what, how does intermittent fasting help a person with a di that is, uh, that's diabetic? Yeah, first of all, I want to say definitely talk to your doctor before doing this. But whenever you so the we want to set the most common is the um, like a 12 hour fast where you don't eat or take in any calories from 
like 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. One, that's our natural circadian rhythm. But anytime we take in any calories, we increase our cortisol levels with which inadvertently increases our glucose levels. So we want to give our body a rest um, and it causes what we call autophagy, where we're it's basically cleaning out the bad cells and getting rid of those and resetting the body. The most important thing when you intermittent fast is when you break the fast, it really needs to be something um, really high in protein. That's really going to help. For, uh, for example, go ahead. Is there... What's high yes. in protein? Yeah, so if you're somebody who likes eggs, that's a good thing. I used to just make an extra piece of meat at dinner time, and that's what I'd have for breakfast. I really do avoid the breads and cereals. Um, that's real important because when you have um, those types of foods, you're getting more carbs. Um, so protein shakes, um, eggs i like the cottage cheese called good cottage cheese it only has four ingredients you actually can mix that with your eggs for more protein um, and fry them that way you can add um, peanuts and nuts and peanut butter and almond butter different things like that but you're looking to get about 30 grams of protein when you break a fast mm -hmm. okay so uh really quick uh why don't we um is there anything that we did not touch on that's important? Well, just some of the dangers, like the complications, really mm -hmm. want us to know how important it is to manage diabetes for the cardiovascular, right? It does increase your risk of <coughs> heart attack and stroke, um, nerve damage like neuropathy. So we hear a lot of numbness and tingling in the legs. I do want to make note of that. Um, sometimes the medication specifically metformin depletes your B vitamins. So if you're having those neuropathies or nerve pain in the legs, I would first have somebody check your B vitamins and maybe start on that to see if that improves it. But kidney disease as well, because that's what filters um, the waste from our blood. So we really want to, and then having your eyes checked every year, um, maybe even sooner because you can get the diabetic retinopathy in the eyes. Always um, having somebody look at your feet when you go to your appointments, take off your shoes, make them look at your feet. That's really important. Um, and then look well, for- Why is, med, since you said that, why is metformin on on the dangers list there is there well, a reason it's actually not on the danger list it's just all almost all medications have a nutrient deficiency with them so metformin's like one of the top one used especially when you're newly being diagnosed most everybody gets put on metformin and so the longer you're on a medication the more it can deplete a nutrient and so b12 it's known to deplete b12 but when you have a b vitamin deficiency you can have nerve pain and so you have to optimize your vitamins when you're taking medications and what exactly for those that don't know uh, what exactly is um, neuropathy? Um, you know, you said where you're not feeling anything or, or having problems feeling stuff. Go ahead. Right. And so neuropathy is when you have damage to the nerves, especially in the feet and the foot. So it's that numbness, tingling feeling that you'll hear people talk about. Um, they can have pain when they walk. Um, it can also lead to infections because if they're not feeling um it they can't tell if they have an infection that's why it's so important to take your shoes and socks off when you're at your doctor's appointment for your diabetes and have them check your mm -hmm. feet okay uh is there any other dangers that people should be aware of um diabetic ketoacidosis um where the sugar um gets increasingly high there the that's life-threatening um, and your wife probably may have had diabetic ketoacidosis when she had those really high levels. It really can alter cognition too. So if you are caring for somebody and their cognition is off and you know it's not normally off, I would get them to be seen mm -hmm. uh, quickly. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we'd like to thank you very much for 
joining me on this edition of Able Den On Air. Uh, for more information on um, on your on your uh, I should say Wellness Wednesday, you know your your YouTube channel on Wednesday. You want to give that information? Yes. Yeah, so. Um... The Way to My Heart, it's a YouTube channel, Desire Wellness with Deidre. There's several different um, YouTubes that The Way to My Heart has done. So you can kind of pick and choose and um, like and subscribe so you always know when there's a new episode. Um, but there's a, they even have on Fridays um, where they're cooking and things like that. So they offer a lot of support for people with cardiovascular PAD. Mm -hmm. So... Okay, well, again, uh, I would like to um, thank you, um, Deidre, for um, joining me on this edition of Able Den On Air. And for more information on um, the YouTube channel for Way to My Heart, you can go to uh, www.waytomyheart.org and also they're also known as the Global Pad Association. Uh, you can go to uh, www.globalpadassociation.org um, and their leg saver hotline is 1-415-320-7138. That is 1-415-320-7138 and uh, like and subscribe uh, the Global Pad Association and Way to my heart, and thank you again, um, uh, Nurse Practitioner Deidre, for joining us on Able Den On Air. Thank and, you for having me. Okay, and thank you for joining me on this edition of Able Den On Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. For more information on Able Den On Air, you can go to www.orcamedia.net, and also you can uh, see my live segments in the morning at uh, Aired Out VT. Dot com. That's www.airedoutvt.com. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. Thank you.